nationwide, worldwide. That's a world. I'm not kidding. On YouTube? Yeah. What? When I, I, I broadcast, when people go on, I try to, I, I broadcast my class a lot. Now that YouTube basically changed, but now I got to work again. And so I can broadcast my class on live. You go to my webpage, there's a link to it. Watch class. Where do you film it from? Where do I film it? I'm with a camera. Right so there. if you're sick at home, you can like mm -hmm. wait. What oh, camera? That one? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Don't touch it. Let's <laughs> see what. Oh yeah. Weird. Oh, and and last year I had somebody from the uh, I had somebody from uh, Yemen watching my class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you like, watch it live, or you save it and upload it so you can watch it later? Both. Oh, okay. yeah. it's live. We're live right now, people. <laughs> yeah, put the wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> What does that look like? <laughs> Nationwide, people will be watching that. And. Yeah, someone from Yemen for a while they started watching every day. I thought that was funny or next, but you'd be surprised how much people watch. But I, that's why I do we put that on there. All right, so. Interaction supply and demand. And, Dr. Ellison said. Supply and demand. I have the eraser. You demand one. Can I have another one? <laughs> All right. So, the division of labor was a way to make it more efficient. As Adam Smith saw, it, an individual, one person working alone, trying to do everything. Think about what he used the example. So I didn't mention this all in class, right? Steel pins, for like for like sewing the pin clothes together. And you can imagine in 1776, that was a pretty hard thing to make. A person, one person making a pin, they would have to well, somehow get the iron, get, get the coal to, to heat it enough, puddle the steel, which is the term of superheating the iron and get out the impurities. That's puddling, they call it, because it's a bubble. Get it? And then make a mold, dump it in the mold, take it out. You have to kind of shave it to make sure it's it's ready to sell, and then sell it. That's relatively inefficient because you have to know all those things. But if you have a bigger group where you can divide the labor, one person gets the iron and the coal. One person does the puddle. One person does the the mold. You see the point? And if they do that over and over again, they become very good at it. They become efficient, so they can work the same number of hours but produce more. And that's the key thing. Division of labor allows for more production. And there's a word I should have put up there. More production. The amount of work they do goes up, and that's called productivity. Division of labor allows for more productivity. Now, it's still a pre-industrial revolution, but he is anticipating it. Because can you imagine how much more productive one person could be if they have a machine, over doing it by hand. That's the great advantage of machines, producing more. But the division of labor is a very logical idea. But you notice what I said. One person alone, very inefficient. If you're bigger and, and can hire more workers, you have an advantage, don't you? Don't forget that. That's huge. We'll come back to that idea. Next. So if we have division of labor, now you're hiring, the idea is workers are being hired to do this, to do different tasks, to produce a good you can sell, to make money, well, in a marketplace. Wages are also decided in the market. There is a labor market, and the labor market decides wages. Remember what I said yesterday. Before the Industrial Revolution, workers were paid based upon what? Skill and the amount of work they do. So they have that choice. You know, I have this skill, I do this much work, I get paid. Not anymore. In capitalism, wages are decided by the market. The amount of people who need jobs, workers, and the amount of jobs, the employers. And so, if there's a whole lot of unemployed people who need jobs, what does that do to wages? Draws. 
even if there are people who have a great amount of skill, if there's a bunch of people with that skill, it drops the wages. Dramatically. If there's a shortage of workers, wages do what? And so when I said wages are not based upon skill, no. The skill only matters if that skill is in demand. If you have a skill that's not in demand, or there's a whole bunch of people with that skill, your wages will drop. Your net wages will drop, or, or at least not go up any, which has the same effect. Does everyone got that? And so a lot of you are thinking, okay, I'm going to school, and there's a lot of reasons to go to school. Partially is to become a better citizen, which sometimes we forget about that. That's why we need classes like this. But also you want to, you hope that when you go to college, for example, if you think about going to college or some other education afterwards, you're going to come up with something, you get a job. I mean, you've got to be honest, you've got to survive. This is the world we live in. You have to make a wage. If you pick an occupation where there's a lot of them, even if you're the best at it, your wages will be low. And that's happening a lot of places. For example, computer science, there's a lot. Not only is there a lot, but because of technology, computer scientists are being replaced in the U.S. because now they commun communicate with lower wage workers doing the same thing in, let's say, India. So what is happening to wages of these people? Yeah, heck up. What was it? Um, what company just... Apple just laid off 3,000 workers in the U.S. Microsoft just laid off 4,000 or 10,000, maybe it was. You start laying off workers. Those who are working, their wages probably won't go down, but they're not going up. And why do you think these companies want to bring in people from, let's say, Pakistan to work in? So they can cut wages. There's, all, there's a shortage in some jobs, too. For example, there's a huge shortage in truck drivers, or the long-range truck drivers. A massive shortage, it's huge. And right now they're whining about it. We won't work, no one will take the job. So wait a second, if there's a shortage, what's gonna to have to happen to get more people to take that job? Higher wages, yeah. And that's going to happen. There's a shortage of nurses. There's a shortage of nurses. In fact, that's really the only job that requires a college degree besides one other that there's a shortage of. And so wages will go up, you know the other one? There is going to be such an incredible shortage of teachers in 10 years that it's going to be a national crisis. I mean, the shortage is so big that it's hard to even comprehend today. Education schools are down 40 to 60% in states. Uh, in California, it's 70% lower with students going into education. Now, there's lots of reasons why, but the thing is, it has to happen. Wages for teachers have got to go up. They have to because you got to get people to take the job. And that's the way the market works. So you can see sometimes they work against you, sometimes they work for you. You know, the problem is, I'm, I'm thinking about when the wages finally start going up from Montana, I'll be retired. Yeah. But then again, I'll be retired. That's not bad. In fact, you guys ought to start working harder for my retirement. <laughs> Bake sales, sell organs. Think about it for a second. <laughs> you guys got two kidneys. Come on. <laughs> you agree? Those. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's actually very true. Uh, I just read an article today about Nevada. They simply can't have teachers. In Philadelphia, half of the students don't have a full-time teacher. They have subs. Who, and the, it, and you know how, what? You can be a substitute teacher, and they, they don't pay them very much. You need a high school diploma. Yeah, <laughs> well, because, and you know, I mean, that's that's the way life is, you're, you know, but still, now you get substitute teachers are not qualified to teach for the most part, some of them, or at least in the subject they, they sub it. You get some that are very qualified. I get teachers here, I, I got a sub one coming, please put me on your list of because I, I have a degree in science, okay, <laughs> but you know. But the point is, that's how it works. But it's also, this is something that's very disturbing. It doesn't matter how hard you work. Wages don't matter. That doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter. Who has a job outside of school? I 
and I work with your parents, I know. <laughs> you have the parent factor that does change things, or have a job in the summer, or you will soon have a job. Okay, you have a job, you work with other people. You ever look at them and think, you don't do a damn thing, we're paid the same. Or you might be that person that look at it and say, look at them, they do nothing, and they're paid the same as me. Now I know it's everyone. Yeah, it's me. That's the way it is. It doesn't matter. And you might say, wait a second, experienced workers get paid more. What's why? So it's better to pay them more because you train them than to train somebody else. Walmart is having so much trouble keeping workers that they have they started raising their wages for experienced workers just a little bit because they had trouble keeping experienced workers. It wasn't that we are so benevolent. No, it was because they had to short each other. And so that's how wages function. That's how they function. And so the wage system would be the one that would anger workers more than anything. Because it didn't matter. Oh, I should add something else. If profits go up, what happened to wages? Profits for the company goes up. What's it do to wages? So the company's making more money. What happens to wages? What? Doesn't affect it. Different markets. The company can make more money than ever before, yet could cut wages. If there's a both of supply of workers and they can do it. In fact, that would just increase their profit, wouldn't it? Before workers were paid by their skill, they got to work and they kept the profit, essentially, even though it wasn't very much. Now the profit goes someplace else. Now, if the profit goes down, what happens to wages? Different market. Doesn't affect it. If profits go down, but you need workers to make money, you still got to pay. And so that's kind of the weird little quirk. Profits don't matter. And that is the ultimate goal then, the profit margin. The profit margin. The profit margin is, I know you've heard margin, and that's a distance. That means the distance between two units. Profit margin means the distance between, or the amount between the cost and your revenues. Have you ever heard of like net profit? That's what it is, profit margin. The difference between cost and revenue. That is profit margin. And by the way, then, what's the best way to make more money? Now remember, cost and revenue. Revenue comes from the sale of your goods. Which one in capitalism, in the perfect market, does the owner have control over? Revenue or cost? Say it again. Cost. Because the price is set by the market. But if they can cut costs, their margin gets bigger. In fact, if they can cut costs, they can drop their costs, undercut their competitors, drive them out of business. Did everyone catch what I just did? And so in business, there's always going to be a desire to aggressively cut costs. Division of labor or do anything possible to lower wages. Children, what do children do to wages? For everybody, they lower wages. Children lower wages. Undocumented, undocumented immigrants. What do they do to wages? Lower them dramatically. Because not only do they increase the labor pool, but they cannot, by law, negotiate for higher wages because they're here. They're, if they're found, they're kicked out. By the way, you know I said undocumented. All that is that's the equipment. If you're found to be in the United States. And either have it on an expired visa or without some kind of documentation, it's like getting a parking ticket. It's the same thing. So boom, and then you send it back home. So it's it's um, illegal immigrants. When I was a kid, it was always illegal aliens. That's not quite true. It's illegal, just the same like if you were speeding and now you're in a you're a lawbreaker, you know, a criminal, and should be in jail. It's about the same equivalent. And so that lowers wages. Also. That's why no one ever does anything about it. They talk about it, they get people riled up, and then what happens? Because it keeps wages for everybody, documented or citizens or undocumented. So, because that cuts costs and therefore profit. And so, lastly, laissez faire. With Adam Smith said in a perfect world, all of this will adjust naturally. 
naturally if government keeps hands off. Hands off is called, okay, it's French, so technically it's laissez faire. It's, that's pretty close. But it's become kind of America fied, if that's not a word it should be. But every economic professor, every teacher, they always say laissez or laissez faire, and that's how I've learned it. But that's not correct. Laws out there. No. Speak American. <laughs> but it means hands off by government. And the idea was in Adam Smith's time, government was picking monopolies, picking winners, helping one business over another one. And what he said was, if everything is relatively equal, and if government isn't helping one, you're picking a winner in the market, then the market will set it through competition. Now, that sounds good. But there are a lot of flaws with it, which Adam Smith knew. This is perfect world, hands off. And I should add, most capitalists, you know, people who start getting the capital, started getting money from this, they stop reading Adam Smith right there. That's perfect. And government don't mess with I do, what I do. Perfect. Then they quit reading and moved on. They didn't finish. Because capitalism changed things dramatically. The only problem for Adam Smith was this. He's going to die. That's his grave. Actually, it's a crypt in Edinburgh. I had to make the pilgrimage. That was the day I did not buy the kilt. And I'm so, so mad I didn't buy a kilt. God! They had a kilt store. I could have bought a really cool kilt. And my wife and I are going, God, it's kind of expensive. And she asked a very logical question, when are you ever going to wear a kilt? And I was like, well, that's not the point. <laughs> so I decided not to buy the expensive kilt, and now I regret it to this very day. Because I would wear it. I would wear it a couple days to school. I would do that. Especially on St. Patrick's Day, I would wear the kilt. Because it was a green plaid. It was black watch plaid. Really cool. You feel sorry for me? But Festivus is coming up, people. Huh? Festivus. What's that? For the rest of us. No, it's best of us. For the rest of us. You don't know what best of us? Oh, heathens. All right, so I had to make the pilgrimage. Yes, I had Haggis that day, too. And to Adam Smith's grave. What's Haggis? Stomach. Stuffed in the stomach of sheep. Various types of meats and sweet meats. Yeah, sweet meats are the heart, the spleen, the kidney. They're sweet. Why would you do that? Because I'm a tourist. And no one is crazy enough to eat that ex except for in hot dogs and in tourism. So I ate that. So Adam Smith died before the Industrial Revolution really took off. And so he, even though he anticipated some of the problems, he never dreamed that the problems he anticipated would be so huge. But also, there's problems, but also the benefits. He never dreamed of the innovation that could be caused by people who would take the risk to get the profit. And so you know, he, never, he could never imagine it. And remember what I told you, the Constitution was written before this ever happened. They couldn't imagine what's coming. Of course, they didn't write it to change. In capitalism, it is that market economy. But now there are really two distinct groups, much more distinct, much more separate than ever before. And you notice I put classes, because they would become classes. This really changed things. And first off, the two classes, the capitalists, also called the bourgeoisie, they take the risk, they buy the machines, they have the capital, but they get 100% of the profit. Remember, labor is a cost. They get 100% of the profit. And, and machines, what a great thing for them. Machines don't ask for a higher wage. Machines don't strike. Machines don't want crazy things like bathroom breaks. And then you have labor, also called the proletariat. And they, what do they get out of it? Wages. But their wages are set by the marketplace. Set by the market. So this one I have people working in a sweatshop in New York City. And here, these are the big capitalists. Soon they're going to be called, they have monopolies. We'll talk more about this after the Civil War, but they call them monopolies trust. And here's everybody, workers. Paper hat was a symbol of a worker, different era. Farmers and politicians all coming and genuflecting before them, controlling society. And 
Capitalism has it. It still functions in a market, but it's he who has the machines has the big advantage. And by definition, which one will have more people? Yeah, and close. There can only be a small number of this because the market will aggressively weed out any competitors that can't compete. If they can't, if there's too many, some won't make money and they won't be driven out. Also, you can't have everybody as the capitalist because then who will buy your stuff? There's only so many. And so by definition, this is going to be smaller. And There'll be a lot of political divide here, but not the way people thought. Andrew Jackson would found, in fact, he is the symbol of American democracy. He also was a very flawed man. He's an interesting guy. The Democratic Party represented them at first, but then would eventually kind of bleed into the other groups. And with laws I fair. Remember, we're back now to government. Government has a huge function in this. The whole idea of laws that fair is let the market decide these things. Well, let the market decide. In fact, this is one of the quotes that Adam Smith has for the wealth of nations. And I love this quote. So I actually I printed it out there and I thought this is someone made a little meme or whatever they call those things. And so I put that in there. But isn't that a great quote? First off, what's his attitude towards business people? He hates them. He thinks they're the biggest, greediest, awful people. Rapacity means essentially greed and, and selfishness. And so, that's what he said. If everybody's looking out for themselves, we'll have a good society. But there's a problem. We'll let the market decide. Now, governments function in the marketplace. You know, they create the currency, they protect the market, they have the laws, they protect contracts. I mean, government has its great function. And so we're talking now about what the people who make up the government, remember that social contract in the Declaration of Independence? You remember that? The people. The market decides this. So we let hands off. Is there a problem? The market will function. Not quite. Because of economies of scale. Economies of scale is the iron rule of economics. The iron rule. Has everyone got that? The iron rule of economics. And what it means is, scale means size. The bigger a player is, the bigger the competitor is, the greater advantage they have. The bigger a company, a manufacturer, anybody, has more money and more wealth and more access to it, the bigger they are, the competitive advantage. Because they can become more efficient, they can cut costs, and they can afford it. Does everyone got that? If you just worked on the economy to scale, my guess is you'll forget. Make sure you get down. The big have a competitive advantage. And this is the iron rule. Yeah, sometimes the big can make mistakes and go out, but for the most part, the big dominate. And we see this in every single part of our lives today. And it becomes even a bigger deal with capitalism. Because most people can't afford the machines. Only a few can. And they have a competitive advantage. And then of just those few, the biggest of those have an advantage. And think about it in terms of business today. Can anyone think of a term of somebody very big? Because of their size. And they can aggressively cut costs and be more efficient because of their size. They can drive their competitors out. What, give me an example of one. Or something that functions kind of like a monopoly, it tries to get a monopoly, but they be the only seller in the market. So that would be like Coca-Cola buying a smaller... Yeah, Coca-Cola can do that. Any competitor, they swallow them up and drive them out of business. Exactly. How many How many pop come? In fact, there's only two. There's only two. And you look at all those other ones, you say you go to the store and get the generic stuff. Who do you think makes those? Oh, well, yeah, they make them. What are the two they look like? I know you still get thrift where you still get something called Chasta, and you get the other one, you have store, store brands. What do you think makes those? Yeah, they control the market. Have you been to Walmart? That's the best example of economies of scale. 
it is so big and so efficient, it can drive down wages and costs and drive its competitors out. The smaller companies don't have a career. Their costs are always going to be higher because of a of scale. Walmart has a huge competitive advantage. How many stores are left that directly compete with Walmart? How many? A few. And some of them aren't doing very well. Have you seen Kmart? <laughs> but Shopo is pretty, it's not doing all that well. Target has a little bit of a niche and they try to sell more, okay, everything relative, but slightly like higher quality they try to sell. Slightly, it's not that much. But still, they're they're dwarfed by sales and by the number of people. Do you know the super like super targets in big cities are the same? They have like two stories. Yeah. But the point is the bigger let's say let's say I'm gonna start a grocery store and you build a little store next to Walmart. How long are you gonna last? Yeah, your costs are gonna be so high. Think about it this way for scale. Think about how much it will cost for you to build one car, how much that one car will cost. I'm gonna go build a car. You build it. Think about how much that will cost per car, right? How about a million cars? Which won't be cheaper per car? The one car or a million cars? The more you make, it's cheaper per unit. Therefore, you can cut costs. How many car companies are there? In the US, there's three. Four? Four. There, there, there's four General Motors and Chrysler. There's, and there's not very many outside. There's a few other companies around the world, but that's it. There's not very many. Because if economies of scale, no one can compete. They just can't compete. Think about cable TV. That's it. That is the only competitors is our cable or our satellite. And cable has huge advantages. Huge advantage of having it on, on a hard line. Think about it. I'm going to start a cable company. Think how much that will cost for you to start a cable company. You're already sunk. You can't do it. Well, and then you'd have to build all, think about it. You have to build all the power lines and all the cable. I mean, you have to do all that stuff. You're doomed. How many, public, how many electric companies are there in the state of Montana? Well, there's a few, there's MDU, there's a few community ones, and then Northwestern. And they're it, so we have no choice. <laughs> Economies of scale give a huge advantage. So, if you're big, you win. Not always, but pretty much that's it. And Adam Smith knew that. And so if you have laws I fair, if government says hands off and you just compete, you're basically saying, Who's going to win? Yeah. By government not getting involved in competition, but this one you have to have, because of economies of scale, that is direct aid to big. Direct aid. So when people say, we got to do something about government regulation to let the market function, what they're saying is, we want the big to get bigger. By definition, there's no way around that. They want to lessen the number of people in competition. So a couple things about that with economies of scale. That is the iron rule, by the way. It happens with countries, too. Once countries get rich, it's really hard for other countries to catch up because they have all the competitive advantages. You know what's going to happen to you very soon? Right now, at least in the state of Montana, it's not like this in other places. Everything's pretty equal for you. Regardless of your income, it's pretty equal for the most part. For school, once you graduate, it's not that way anymore, is it? Then scale takes over. The more wealth you have access to, the more options you have, without a doubt. And not only that, not only have more options for, let's say, school or whatever you do after education, you have another big thing. You can make huge mistakes and totally screw up. But if you have access, if you have access to wealth, big size, you can make those mistakes and be fine. If you totally screw up and don't have much access, you're, you're done. And boy, doesn't the pressure and the stress go up that way? Is that accidental? This is policy. This is politics. These are decisions that people made. So it's not like this on accident. So a couple things. With the profit going to the owners, 
The marketplace, by definition, promotes inequality. The market will promote it. Now, this is not bad, necessarily. Think about it. Do you see somebody doing really well and they have a nice house and stuff? What are you thinking? Maybe I should work harder and innovate. Maybe I can get that. And so a little bit of inequality really does help encourage innovation and risk. I can do that, too. But there's a problem. If the focus is too much, the focus is too much. As you can see, why does it not do that? I hate when it does that. If you don't have equality, you don't have a free market anymore. Competition goes away. Because no one else can compete. Only a few companies can compete. And what you have is even a greater concentration of wealth. Now, capitalism does amazing things. But he who has the capital gets the profit and can get bigger. And you get a big concentration of wealth. Now, why is concentration of wealth such a big deal? Okay, it caused real problems. Real problems politically, socially, okay. that whole revolution thing. But capitalism will eat itself eventually because it kills off the demand. If all the wealth focuses to the very top, Who's going to buy the stuff? And if no one buys the stuff, now Adam Smith saw this. He saw this and wrote about it. But no one cared. They just got the laws I fair and stopped it. Equality is a big deal. Because if you don't have equality, you don't have competition. You don't have competition, wealth will focus, wealth will focus, you kill off demand. They have a name for it today. It's called an don't ask me why they call it this, and I'm still trying to figure out why they have the name for this. You don't have to write this down, but when demand is killed off, secular stagnation. I'm still trying to figure out what, why they came up with secular stagnation. Because secular means operating outside the bounds of the church. I don't understand. The economies are weird. My brother's one. He's very weird. Are you watching, Mark? Okay, so. <laughs> but very bright. And, and didn't get too many concussions. So, what Adam Smith said, there is a role of government. Government should not interfere with the marketplace, but government should ensure competition. And what is the only way to ensure competition? To make sure nobody gets what? Too big. And that was the role. If nobody gets too big, competition can happen. So there is a role of government. You see why I said they quit reading after laws I fair? They want to keep getting big, yay! And so he knew there was going to be a problem, but he never dreamed how big the problem would be with capitalism. Now, it doesn't mean it's all bad. I mean, there's some incredible things with capitalism, but it does have that problem with concentration of wealth. First off, we got to have my two cartoons about this. I just thought this was really funny. And then that is pretty funny. Can you read it? <laughs> Can you see it? The problem is, how do you know? <coughs> it's invisible. Get it? We're number one. Okay. So, the distribution of wealth. In distribution of wealth, wealth will focus to those on top of capitalism because they have the capital, they get the profit. And it will cause problems. And you see this every time. There's a huge explosion of wealth, and eventually there'll be a crash because of the lack of demand. Now, it's really hard to figure out wealth before 1913 because that's pre-income tax and nobody really kept track of income. And by the way, it's really hard to figure out wealth too. Income they can do, but once you get income, how do you tell how much wealth you have? Because people buy up houses, they put paintings, or all this kind of stuff. How do you measure that? How do you even know? So it's really hard to do wealth. 1900, we don't know how concentrated it did, but there would be a crash, progressive movement, sunk here. That's back for the Great Depression. And then you notice how the concentration goes down. There was a concerted effort in the United States to change that and boost the income for everybody from the bottom, literally 99%. A concerted effort. 
Anybody want to guess when it ended? And you can see it right there, 1980, that ended. And now it's here, it's about here right now. It's over 50% now, in the top 1%. This is another graph of it, and I just thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, this is the percentage of wealth, and it's about a quarter of the wealth, that's back in 19, or 18, I'm sorry, 2012, but a quarter of the wealth was in the bottom 50%. Now it's about 20% of the wealth in the bottom 50%. And all of this is the 1%. And this is more today. And so it's pretty stark. And what happens is there could be social problems, economic or social problems and political problems, but the big thing is this kind of inequality is, in, is a ticking time bomb. Because the the gap between the rich and poor is going faster than ever, and wages are stagnant for almost everybody else are dropping. And so eventually, there'll be a cut in demand, and we just had a crash. But it's going to happen again. Just as after you guys go to college, I hope. No, I'm sorry about that. Hmm? What's that? 2008? There was a... There was a, it was the worst economic crisis of the Great Depression. You were alive. <laughs> we're still actually kind of in it. Now, they call it the Great Recession to differentiate it from the Great Depression. All right, so, 12, laissez-faire economics. Laissez-faire economics then became this idea that developed in early capitalism. And this is government policy, government policy. And government policy was twofold, hands off of competition. So let competitors do whatever they want to compete. And that means, remember what I told you, aggressively cut costs. But at the same time, massive government aid for business. And that's gonna include virtually paying no taxes, uh, and uh, having patents. I'll talk more about that later. But a couple more really big things are gonna come out of this. Huge immigration encouraged by the United States. They made it easier to come in as an immigrant in, um, during when Jefferson was president and allowed this. 1840, there's going to be a wave of new immigration. And I put this up here. This is the percentage of immigrants coming to the, the percentage of the population were immigrants by 1860. And look at this. In the north, they all went. The population is changing dramatically. We'll talk a little bit more about why that happened. But immigrants do two things. First off, immigration actually increases the market, so more profit. But immigrants also do one other thing. You know what it is? In the short run, what does it do to wages? Drops wages. Drops wages, lowers costs. And that's why you have Henry Clay's American system. Remember we had the tariff bus and internal improvements? That was direct aid for business. He wanted the federal government at first, to build roads, canals, harbors, but then the biggie, railroads. Tariff keeps out foreign competition. Bank of the United States, where there's a financial system that allows them to have credit. Government aid for business. And much like Alexander Hamilton's program, this is very close. In fact, put a little notation. This is close to Hamilton, not synthesis. Today, even more synthesis. This is what we call conservative economics. Focus money on top with the idea that that will encourage economic growth. All right. So now we have a bunch of reactions to this. And one of the big reactions was the temperance movement. Now, this is actually mocking the temperance movement, but it's kind of funny. So you notice. And there's. Saying, but who would want to kiss? Then you get it. Ha uh ha. -huh. Okay, so reactions. And the first big reaction we have to get to every time there is a convulsion in society, economic change, people are insecure. And you can't think of anything that would change society more than the Industrial Revolution. The first big reaction, second great awakening. It's no coincidence that you have the second great awakening. This huge growth and radical shift in churches as a reaction to the massive 
huge changes that happened to the world for the Industrial Revolution. Now, this is the burnt over district of New York. And the burnt over is where the, most of the fiery revivals were, the Second Great Awakening. And there are all these new sects, almost all Protestant, that developed out of this era. Also, uh, one that was partially Christian and then also outside of Christianity, especially early on. Uh, Mormons came out of, out of the burnt over district of New York. That's where they became big. Most of them fell apart. The churches did not survive. Uh, Mormons barely survived because they nearly were all killed. Joseph Smith would be assassinated. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to Utah. And that's why they fled. They got the heck out of the U.S. Why were they shocked when the United States got Utah back? Yes. So, this is a reaction, though. And this is a big shift in churches. It went from less emphasis on the Bible, less emphasis on like predestination, and more emphasis on emotion. Emotion. And that feeling of, of almost euphoric joy that some of these that these revivals would be for people who, who thought they were now saved. And therefore, could the world's really tough, but everything's going to be okay in the long run. And if you ever heard of the rapture, the rapture was an invention of the Second Great Awakening. That's where that hope came from, where, yes, things are tough now, but it's going to be okay. It's a really interesting thing how that happens. When things get more secure, membership in churches go down. Things get more um, frightening, it goes up. You see that every single time, and all over the country. And one more thing, and I have to add this book, The Bell Rings. And this is actually pretty important, so you might want to get this down. There is a massive and well-organized plot against me. Against me. Me! You got that down? Everyone's out to get me. How do I know that? I'm not paranoid, I just know that. Yeah, there's a camera watching them before you think that thing is. Yeah, oh yeah, it's watching you. And so, I talked about this first period and third period, and I gotta tell you guys, the threat of assassination is high, and obviously, right? Correct? Civilization has got to survive, therefore me. <laughs> Correct? And so people can walk right in here, and they can be a potential assassin. I can't see them, because I am working for you. Correct? So what do you have to do? Hmm? Get rid of me? <laughs> to the pillory. That's why we're going to heat you. <laughs> more me of an assassin comes, which means anybody, right? Okay. Right. So what do you yell? Assassin. So let's practice this. I will be any person walking in. <laughs> let's try this out. Here we go. I walk in. Yes. That's lame. I can have a knife in my back. <laughs> let's try this again. You want to go to lunch? <laughs> Assassin! All right, now what if it's an administrator? Assassin. You yell assassin and then hide under your desk. So, <laughs> so let's practice this. Imagine I'm Mr. Dantel. Let's try this. <laughs> this is how Mr. Dantel would walk in, right? Assassin! And then under your desk, people! <laughs> Come on! <laughs> I'm serious. An administrator comes in. Yell assassin, hide under the desk, and then we'll watch their eyes. That hasn't happened for a couple of years because they never come down here. <laughs> Could somebody get one like, please? I did show you Nazi Barbie, didn't I? Good, all right, good. 